Thank you for tuning in to Yes You Can Us That with Isabel Carmody. Brought to you by Morton Bay Public Libraries. We sat down with Isabel to ask a few questions. Question 1. Do you consider yourself a young adult or fantasy author? Hi, I'm Isabel Carmody and welcome to my lockdown. As you see, it's not a terribly difficult lockdown. I, I have a swimming pool to swim in, thanks to some friends who I'm staying with. And uh, I'm going to answer some questions now about myself as a writer and about writing. First question was um, whether I see myself as a fantasy writer or um, a children's author. And I would say that the answer to this is that I don't see myself as either. I don't define myself in this way because, um, well, a couple of reasons. First of all, fantasy author. Um, I don't think you put the form of a writing on top of the writer. I don't think you, you claim that form. I think the, the piece of writing or the ideas that you're exploring dictate the form. And I think it's like if you want to make a white sauce or you make a beautiful sauce for some dish you're making and you always make it in an old beaten up battered pot that does a beautiful job and you get some newfangled thing given to you for a birthday or Christmas and you don't use that when, when you want to make a great sauce. You actually um, reach out and get your old pot because you know that that's going to work for you. And the things that make writing, uh, allow writing to be called fantastic or science fiction are the things that work for me. My battered old pot is fantasy and science fiction. And probably because I read it, um, it spoke to me very deeply. It was a perfect vessel for some of the ideas that I wanted to write about. I mean, fantasy and science fiction have a scope you can write with, which I find I don't write like that when I write realistic material. When I write realistic material, it's much closer and a smaller, it's a microcosm. The more realistic I get, the more the smaller the surrounds in a way. Um, so that's why I wouldn't say that I would call myself a fantasy writer because I'll switch genre depending on what it is that I want to write. The, sh the writing dictates the form for me. Uh, and the other thing is uh, that um, I don't see myself a children, as a children's author because A, I was one when I first started to write. I was like 14 when I first started to write my first novel and uh, you know at 14 I was a kid and I was writing about someone my own age struggling with issues that were like mine and as I said a second ago fantasy was the way, science fiction, science fantasy was the way in the Obi Newton Chronicles I was trying to explore about being what it felt like to be an outsider, to be a misfit, to be in a, a world that seemed ethically not to operate very in the ways that I thought a world should operate. Human beings behaved in ways I didn't think they should behave. There seemed a lot of injustice and uh, fantasy and science fiction allowed me to write it. I was a kid when I was writing it. Um, people ask me now, did I write that book for children? Well, there, there, there's your idea of a children's author. Um, it's just that people tend to think that if you write for children you must do it on purpose, that you must have some kind of agenda or, or idea or, or mission about something. And I'm, I think some writers do, but uh, I don't personally believe the best way to write for children is to write for children, actually. I think you channel the child in yourself when you, when you write, you draw on your own memories and you write for an imagined child that's you, really, I think. What I wanted to read, what I read, what I loved, is what I'm writing for, also, in a way. And the other thing about, you know, designating an age group is that how do you know what adults read, what children read? A 14-year-old boy can be an incredibly sophisticated reader, whereas a 40-year-old man can be barely functional as a reader, not have read a book since he was a schoolboy, and even then didn't read through a full one. So to say, and to, to designate an age group, no, I, I find that, I, I just don't see the point in it. I don't think it works and I don't see the point in it. What I tend to do is, when I'm writing for a certain, um, or appear to be writing for an age group, I suppose is the best way to put it, or and market it as writing for a certain age group, that's a marketing decision and they've figured that out. That's a category they can aim the writing at and there's a lot of readers there that are likely to enjoy it. So it's a marketing decision. Um, when I... You know, when I write, I find that people of all ages will read the things that I write. And the thing that's, that I, I find most complimentary is that um, they're inclined to say to me that I reach them. And that can be a 90-year-old man or a 12-year-old girl. And if you write and it reaches that span, I think it just tells you 
that a writer is not writing outward, but writing inwardly, reaching very deeply for truths they understand and writing those. So again, the age thing is really problematic to me. I write around a character. If a character is 12, I draw on my own memories of childhood. I try to think what it would be like. I imagine what it would be like to put that self into that situation and what is the most truthful way that I can write that character? What are the genuine feelings I might have had at that age? So it's the age of the character that I'm really focused on, not the age of the reader. Question two, which writers have inspired you the most and why? The writers I've admired most have been, um, well, there's a lot of them. Uh, you know, I was very influenced when I was young by The Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe robe, and uh, the Susan Cooper Dark is Rising series, um, uh, Lord of the Rings, um, a lot of books. Uh, one that really was very important to me was Enid Blyton's uh, little lesser read, lesser known, I'd say, um, retelling of Paul Bunyan's um, A Pilgrim's Progress. Um, she titled it uh, The Land of Far Beyond. And I think all of these books looking back were influential to me because they they were connected to me becoming a writer although I didn't know at the time I was learning from them um, what I learned from the land of far beyond was that you could write a story about what went on inside a person um, spiritually or emotionally as if it were a journey that were happening outwardly um, so th that was the most perhaps the most important book that I read because it was rereading that year after year after year, not understanding why I was almost addicted to having it even accessible, even if I didn't reread it, I had it constantly borrowed from the library. It was because it was doing what I wanted to do. And the other writer that's been a huge influence on me is Ursula Le Guin. And for the same reasons, you know, she was mastering what it was that I really wanted passionately to be able to do. And that was to write stories about what happened to people ethically and morally when things were when they were negotiating situations or um, events in their own lives. So uh, those writers were doing what I wanted to do and I was hungry, I suppose, now that I look back, I was hungry for some sort of understanding. Although I, I, w I didn't know it then, I just really loved those books and reread and reread them. I, I learned to be a writer rereading those writers and I still read Ursula Le Guin to this day because of the fineness and also the, the honed quality of her writing, which I'm much wordier. You know, I was very attracted to um, Margaret Atwood, not Margaret Atwood, uh, Angela Carter, Angela Carter, because of her ornate writing. You know, if you look at A Company of Wolves or um, one of those stories that you, they're so rich. She has dozens of adjectives, which you're not supposed to ever use because, you know, we're all about not using adjectives anymore. I love them, I adored you know, the use of adjectives and this lush kind of unfolding of a story. I loved fairy tales and myths for this lush kind of language. And uh, even though I knew you weren't supposed to do that somehow as a writer or that, that it was not what people wanted from you, I could do the other kind of writing. I could do that sparse writing, but I was drawn to the other kind. Ursula Le Guin seemed to, for me, was the perfect sparse writer. She teaches me again and again what it is to be a beautiful sparse writer. But it doesn't stop me from accessing that lushness and that love, love of lush language as well. So it seems to me if I could put the two together, Angela Carter's lushness and Ursula Gwynne's sparseness and her integrity, um, I would be the writer I, I want to be. So yeah, people have influenced me, but for those reasons mostly. Question three, what inspired you to write the Kingdom of the Lost series? I come up with the idea of um, the Land of the Lost series, that is um, the Red Wind, the Cloud Road, um, the Ice Maze and the final one which will come out in a couple of months, um, uh, the Velvet City. Well the beginning was these two little guys, these two little cute guys. See the different tales, they're just a little bit different. I found these second hand in a, in a giveaway bin in, a, in an op shop in Eastern Europe and uh, I called this little guy Billy. Billy means white in Czech, and this little guy Žluti. Žluti means yellow in Czech. 
and uh, I was going to give them to my little daughter. She was three then and I was nowhere near writing um, a book for a three-year-old or a five-year-old or any age group at all. I wasn't writing the little fur books, which were the first books I wrote, which were marketed for younger children. Um, but I did get these little guys and I was going to give them to Adelaide. And uh, Babichka was with me and she said, let's give this one to Clara, her six-year-old sophisticated cousin and my three-year-old Adelaide. And I hated the thought of separating them. I just thought they managed to get to the rubbish bin together. We shouldn't separate them. So we separated them because I was an adult and you can't make that kind of argument about toys. Um, and uh, poor little Billy went off to a house where there was a dog and eventually had his little paw chewed off. And when that happened, I couldn't bear it any longer. I traded two Selena Gomez tapes to um, Clara and I put the two little brothers back together. And in those days, it was kind of hard to get English books in the Czech Republic. So like any mother does, I wrote some stories for my little girl about Billy and Schluti. And they were not stories I ever, I was writing books. I'd written 50 books or something. And I wasn't writing books to be published uh, uh, the, for little kids. I was writing for Adelaide and they were no more publishable than any adult's book written for a little, a specific little child. Um, Adelaide was in the stories as a character. Um, but these two little guys were affected by their history. Billy was always timid and gentle and quiet and Jluti was intrepid and, and brave and bold. And the only little funny thing that used to happen was that Beely was the brave one, Beely was always the adventurer, but somehow he was always asleep or doing something when Beely had adventures, much to his amazement, and he was always very timid. So that was how the characters were when we played with them. After I'd written all four of the Little Fur books and illustrated them all, I was looking to, to draw it again, to, do, to draw again and to do another book. And because I'd written about these two little guys and drawn them many times for Adelaide, they were natural for me to come to, but I didn't actually want to draw them as, um, I didn't want to tell the story that I'd told Adelaide, I just started to come up with another story. And the ideas in my mind really were how we as human beings throw away so many things, things, people, relationships, toys, um, once we've, we, we've finished with them. And yet things have a life of their own. Um, everything has a life of its own. And these little guys had a whole complex life after they were bought for some child when they were new and maybe passed on from brother to sister. So I was thinking about this way we human beings throw away things. And uh, so the land of the lost is starts off um, being, you would imagine the land of the lost refers to the land in which these two little brothers live. This fairly empty land where stuff falls from the sky through a crack in the sky to the ground and no one knows where it comes from or what it's for. And there's a stone storm where these little guys' house gets destroyed and they have to go looking for a new home. That's basically the overarching story. Where does the stuff in the sky come from? What does it all mean? Who are they? Where did they come from? Why is there no one else like them? And uh, finally, will they ever find a home? Question four. Elspeth and others in the Open Newton Chronicles have special abilities. Which are most significant and which do you wish you had? Elspeth and the other characters um, that, are, that, that are in the uh, Open Newton Chronicles have a lot of special abilities. Um, they far seek, they coerce, they have empathy uh, and various other abilities. Um, if I could have any ability I wanted, I think I would have one that I haven't got in that series and that would be projective empathy. And that, that would be the power to project from one person into another the, the feelings they were experiencing. So let's say you had a government minister who was making very draconian laws about school children or something and uh, these children were being kind of locked up or whatever and uh, I would be able to send the feelings of that child into the mind of that politician and they would have to deal with um, what they were causing. I mean it's probably just a you know a version of the old uh, do unto others thing but it would give me that I would have the power to be able to make that happen. So projective empathy. Um, in the Open Newton Chronicles the, the power of empathy is really important um, it's the one power that um, Elspeth feels that she doesn't have and uh, because she feels she doesn't have it, she f she's cut off her, herself from her emotions. Um, she feels that she can't feel things, that she doesn't necessarily 
you know, experience things strongly enough emotionally. She feels she lacks emotions and she's to some extent frightened of them. There are reasons, like in anybody's life, trauma tends to shut you off and you, you produce layers of protection. And Elspeth has that in her past, which she's also putting between herself and the world. But in part, she, but of course she does have empathy. She has great empathy. The whole reason she's protecting herself is that, is that empathy she has. Um, all of those powers though um, are, are not only just powers which you know who doesn't as a kid wish to be able to fly or to be invisible or something so it's wishful thinking to a certain extent of course are playing with a memory of what you wished for question five as a writer who illustrates what advice do you have for putting writers and illustrators of graphic novels and children's books illustrate my books well i don't think of myself really as an illustrator um, I certainly am not trained. Um, I've always drawn. I drew for my brothers and sisters all through childhood, um, comic books and whatnot, and lots of little cartoons. And uh, when my daughter was growing up, um, I used to tell her this story about this little character called um, Little Fur. Um, and I used to we'd get back home after me walking with her and telling her whatever bit of the story I'd get made up for that day. And uh, she would say, draw, draw a little fur for me, Mama. So I did. I used to draw her over and over and over again with the various animals in various configurations. And, uh, you know, I didn't think of that book being, that story being something I would get published. But one day it came to me that my daughter wouldn't want that story forever and I would therefore not be able to tell it anymore. And that just seemed really such a shame. And uh, because I wanted to go on telling it. So I thought, well, you know, you're a writer, you can write it as a book. So I started. But then I realised very quickly that um, if it was published, if anyone took it on, they'd want illustrations for it. And I didn't want anyone else's version of Little Fur, but mine and Adelaide's. So it, was, it meant a great deal to us. So uh, I wrote to the publishers. I did these four little pictures um, with my daughter's $2 paint box or $3 paint box, whatever, from the supermarket of Little Fur, Fox, and a, I think a couple of other pictures. I can't remember what they were now. And I sent them to the publisher with my story and said, this is what I'd like to write about, but here's the catch. I want to do the illustrations. And uh, they said yes. So I was ecstatic for about four seconds and then I was completely horrified because I suddenly realised that I actually had to do it. And I'd sold them four books, not yet written, one was written, and uh, I had to do 120 illustrations for the first book. And that's a whole different thing than drawing the odd little drawing for your daughter. So I, I really was quite frightened for a while, but then I thought, well, I can't have made this big fuss and be given this incredible opportunity and, and squander it, I have to try. So I started to, you know, draw. I drew the same drawings I'd always done, but I did them over and over again and gradually realized that the drawings themselves could be very simple if the background was complex. And by complex, I mean patterned. So that was kind of my style right from the start. I, I really love, um, well, I was very influenced by the Moomin Troll, Tove Janssen's gorgeous black and white illustrations, um, black ink illustrations, black and white ink. And uh, also I love Edward Gorey's illustrations and he's someone who really, really knows how to put a pattern together. And there was something, there must be some, you know, bit of me that loves this completely detailed kind of tiny cross hatching or a million leaves or a million grains of sand each drawn as a tiny circle some bit of me found that very zen process so I would have my simple drawings and then around it I would do this other stuff and I didn't I would say make the mistake of trying to be a professional illustrator because if I had I would have had to have gone back and learned about perspective and the golden mean and all those things I know only as words and vaguely but a, a real illustrator knows those things and they've trained for years. So I thought, I'm, I'm just going to go with what I know and if it isn't good enough, somebody will tell me. So I did 170 drawings because I thought they'll choose the best of them. Or was it? I think I'm, it might have been 120 drawings I did. And I thought, and they wanted 90 or something. And I thought, I'll give them a lot more. And then I can't do anything again because I'm not that good at drawing. I couldn't repeat anything and make it better. It would be a completely different drawing the next time. So I discovered. So um, I sent it off. And uh, they really liked the illustrations. And um, 
So that's, that's how the illustration came about. I guess the advice I would take from that to give to anybody is that if you love drawing and you have a passion for it, then do it and just keep doing it because you can't help but getting better. And if you do want to do something, you know, something more, you know, if you do want to take it into your own writing, well, you've got to be prepared to invest a bit of time in it. And by that, I don't mean going and taking classes, although that may be the thing you want to do and need to do and that's good for you. But to, to put some time into it in the th thinking about it like when I was when I'm looking at pictures now I, or drawings or even the world like have a look over here this pattern of leaves the other day I was lying there after a swim and I noticed how the how you can see maybe even a little bit of it how the reflection is on the leaves and I just thought how you know it would be nice to sort of try and capture that how would you capture that so I found myself and still find myself often dissecting the world in terms of what visually things look like like patterns and what kind of shapes and what I'd like to draw um, and some things I'm always loving the idea of drawing like snow and sand and water and and, and uh, clouds are things I uh, difficult to draw almost impossible to draw so, sort of textures in the world in a way um, but uh, I never let not being able to draw stand in the way of wanting to draw something I have an idea and I just pour it into the drawing and just do the best that I can and I would say that's what you have to do if you love drawing enough eventually you'll get there and if your drawings are not good enough okay then you've got a great idea you can give to to an illustrator or you you know how to describe it to an illustrator so that's another way of thinking about it I mean there are projects I would take on that I would have no idea at all how to do myself uh, but I know what to say I know how to describe it I can even block it out in a way and then hand it on to somebody else or although I don't know now would I be able to hand it on I have a graphic novel idea and uh, I'm not sure anymore I want to have a go at it I know that much again I will bite off more than I can chew and one of these days it'll be too much and I'll have to spit it out again this may be the project in which case I will bonelessly let it go and recognize I've reached my limitation if there is a limit to be reached I don't Think, I guess the thing I, I could say about writing and illustrating is one of the one of the gifts if I could say that put it in this way the gifts I have is that I don't put huge obstacles in front of myself by imagining ambitions I'm not ambitious I don't have huge ambitions I, I try something but right in the middle of trying it or knowing I've taken it on I acknowledge that I might fail I know it might be too much for me and I I'm fine with that and what worries me sometimes is young artists and writers and illustrators just have such huge ambitions immediately and their ambition gets in the way of what they really might have in themselves to, to, to explore. So with illustration and with writing, I think that's the rule of thumb. That would be the main advice I would give. Don't put your ambitions, don't put your ideas of how your work might be received in the world out there as an ambition looming over you and overshadowing you because it's really hard to work in the shadow of that thing. It's much easier if you're, 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 your desires are humble and you just are prepared to work really hard and try things. Trying things is wonderful. Putting some huge ambition in front of yourself, that's just a huge, that's just a putting a, a hurdle in front of yourself that you have to get over before you can even begin to write. Question six. You once said that you would make a poetic choice ahead of a grammatical choice every time. Why is poetry so important to you? I know once in an interview I said something about, you know, making a, a poetic choice um, always over a grammatical choice. A choice. And uh, the question I was asked, um, or I'm being asked now is, you know why why poetry is important to me i would say when i write poetry is important in the sense that language itself can be poetic and you know you can be the kind of writer who just you know writes what's happening and that has a sort of poetry too a blank stark kind of meter and i guess meter uh, is what i'm talking about rhythm and poetics for me is all about probably rhythm some of the time and when i talk about poetic language that's really what I'm talking about not the writing of poetry but that poetic meter of language like sometimes when I'm writing you know I'll, I'll write a sentence and that's that has a certain feel for me names you know when I invent names they have a certain rhythm for me and that rhythm corresponds somehow in some you know amorphous you know impossible to explain way with either the character or the place that I'm naming or whatever it is and 
you know, the sound of language, the metre of language is how I define that. If an editor makes a change, I can often find it, even if they have forgotten to, to mark it because the metre doesn't feel right, the sentence doesn't have the right rhythm. So I'm always conscious that there needs to be some kind of rhythm and I do have it when I write. I mean, I think if you're a writer like me who uses a lot of descriptive words where, you know, it's sometimes seen that it's better to write, you know, this sparse language, the better you are, the more sparsely you write. But, you know, then you look at someone like Angela Carter and you can see this is a writer who nobody ever told her too many adjectives. And she does it beautifully and she can do it because she uses the rhythm of language to allow herself the scope in which to build up this beautiful tapestry of embroidered writing. And I, you know, that's the sort of writing I'm, I love to do. I'm very attracted to, you know, layer upon layer upon layer of writing. And, uh, and if a grammatical choice requires that I, you know, it would seem to be better grammar if I don't do this thing, but the language of a, of a character speaking or my description of something requires me to mess around with the grammar, I'll do that because it works better. I do it a lot with dialogue and characters. I think that's one of the best ways you can show character out of dialogue and that's by using the sound and the meter of language and the way language is spoken by a character to tell you something about them, showing rather than telling in the most powerful way. Um, I also love poetry. Um, I have this online poetry club where I send people, a number of lucky people, a poem a day and those people are um, send me back a poem from time to time too so it's not an everyday thing these days but it is an exchange and it's not my poetry although every now and again I'll post one of mine I don't see myself as again like being an illustrator I don't see myself as a published poet I'm not seeking publication um, it's just something I like to do and every now and again can I get on a roll have a bit poetry binge and then I stop and go back to you know writing or whatever else it is that I'm doing Question seven, how do you know when a book is finished? Oh, that's a good question. How do I know when something's finished? It's the best question maybe in some ways because it requires a certain pragmatism. And you know, a lot of people when they write get all caught up in this kind of poet, this poetic ideal of this bohemian writer striding around uttering poetry in the middle of the night while drinking whiskey or something. I mean, first of all, I couldn't write and drink whiskey at the same time. Second, I don't like whiskey. Um, I think uh, finishing and that pragmatic streak go together. It means that when you start something, you know that you've got to finish it. And there is no ending to a piece of writing in the sense that there's an ending to life or an ending to some episode in life or a journey comes to an end. Writing isn't like that. You may, you do journey towards an end and hopefully you have some notion of what the end might be, or at least I need to know somehow, some sense of what the end will be like. But I, I, you do have to choose it. I mean, there are many places you could end a story and usually what you're trying to say or what the story is beginning to say for you um, dictates where the end will be. And sometimes that's a little bit left or right of where you thought you were going to write or the story can take you very far away from where you thought you were going to go. Um, but you do have to end. You do have to come to an end at some point. Um, for me, it's, it's when I start to feel fretful about about where I'm going to end. I start feeling there's an ending and I can see it could go this way or it could go that way, which tells me I'm getting to an ending. And then it's just simply a matter of making a decision because there's no wrong decision. If you write to that end and it doesn't work, you can go back and redo it. So deciding and decisively moving forward is better than trying to figure out the perfect ending in your head. This is one of those things where I think you've got to let your hands and your writing take you to the end. Um, for me also, uh, it's important to come to an end because a thing has an emotional arc for me, a very strong emotional arc to whatever it is that I've imagined at the end. And it's usually for me something very visual at the end, a character walking somewhere, doing something. And I might only have that in the vaguest sense. Question eight, what are you reading currently? What am I reading now? Um, I'm reading a couple of things. I'm rereading Miss Smell Smiller's Feeling for Snow. Um, I'm reading an Edward Gorey book called The Gashly Gom Tinies. <laughs> um, 
looking at the patterns again. Um, I'm reading a book called Cavalier and Clay, um, which is I've only just begun. Um, I'm reading a Murakami book about what I think about when I run, a series of essays, and one of them is what I think about when I run. I love his writing. Um, I can't think of what else, but I'm always reading several books at the same time. Always. Question nine. What moment defined you as an author? The defining moment of being a writer. I think it was, in fact, when I was typing one of the little fur books, the first little fur book, and Adelaide came through the kitchen when she was about six or seven or eight, something, to get her. I told them to her when she was six, so she would have been about eight when I was writing it. And she was going to get a snack, and when I type up a handwritten manuscript, I mutter to myself, and I, I muttered something about Little Fur, and Adelaide came over and said, Mama, are you writing about Little Fur? And I said, yes. And she said, oh, read me a page. And she often did this reading a page. And so whatever horrible thing I was writing, whatever it was, even if it was a report or something, I read it out loud. And she was always very polite. She would say, Mama, that's really interesting, but I have something I need to do in my room now, if it was boring. But on this particular occasion, she listened to the end of the page and I got to the end of it and she had such a strange expression on her face. And I said to her, don't you, don't you like it? And she said, but Mama, Little Fur is real, isn't she? And that was the moment I really realised that that in writing a story I told her, I, I, I raised the question of whether it was real or not. And I just suddenly st struck me in that moment about what it was to be a writer, it was to pin down stories in some way. That's the only significant moment I can think of. Falling over on the Opera House stage, that was another moment that I'd rather forget. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Yes You Can Ask That with Isabel Carmody, brought to you by Moreton Bay Public Libraries. <laughs>